Welcome back, everyone. We now continue with our special investigation into hydrofracking. Our reporter, Kim Lengel, as you just saw, she brought us an in-depth piece that really covers what hydrofracking is, um, really the five W's and the H from the, how the wells are drilled to what's in the fracking fluid. And we've put that piece up on our website as well as some sneak peeks into what we'll be bringing you this week. So please check it out. Go to rnntv.com slash hydrofracking and you'll see all the information there. All right, now, gas companies, they certainly have been touting the new developments in hydrofracking as good for our country from an economic as well as an environmental standpoint. They're even making commercials to spread the word. Natural gas is critical to our future. At ExxonMobil, we recognize the challenges and how important it is to do this right. You know that when you make commercials, uh, this is a powerful force with billions of dollars behind it. And it certainly is a major industry with both promise and some would argue peril. The president, in his State of the Union address a few weeks ago, he echoed that same sentiment. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. The experts believe this will support more than 600,000 jobs by the end of the decade. All right. Now, earlier I spoke with a man who says the country is going down a dangerous and a harmful path with hydrofracking, especially some of the newer methodologies behind it, especially with the industry uh, really driving this train. Now, this gentleman was named one of the people who matter in 2011 by Time magazine. He's an engineer who helped develop fracturing techniques more than 25 years ago, but today he finds himself saying that the industry has been too risky and is taking hydrofracking to the extreme. The engineer and professor at Cornell University now, Anthony Ingrafia. Uh, you're one of the original folks um, from the engineering side uh, who really came across this. Talk about how hydrofracking has really changed as an extract method from when you began to where we are now. The technology and the science and the engineering behind hydraulic fracturing has really moved along over the last 20 years. What's proposed for New York State was high volume hydraulic fracturing. High means way beyond anything that I ever thought of or the people in the industry and I were working on back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You know, Professor, how you've been branded um, by some in the industry that you're a rogue engineer. Um, uh, you come at this from a very complicated, I would say, background as one of the originators of fracking and now what it's turned into, uh, as we've seen, you've obviously voiced com some concerns. What do you say to those industry critics who say that you've got an axe to grind? I don't have an axe to grind. Uh, everything has its limits. What's proposed for New York State is 100 times, not 10 times, but 100 times more fracking fluid. So that increases the scale of everything. Uh, the amount of fluid that's necessary, the amount of chemicals that need to be transported and injected with water in the fracking fluid, the size of the equipment that has to be on the surface in order to pump that much fluid at very high pressures, uh, and then, of course, the amount of waste that's produced. What industry has currently done in other states, thankfully not yet in New York State, is uh, just tore open the barn door and said, drill, baby, drill everywhere we can, as fast as we can, using the technology as we learn how to do it, and using people's backyards as, as experimental stations. And what that has done is driven down the cost of gas. And some people would say, well, that's good. On the other hand, I see it as when gas now is a losing proposition, we have now given a disincentive to the industry for best practices. Because best practices for shale gas development are more expensive than dumb practices. You believe that there is a happy medium. You can frack, but not in the density that they're attempting to do and not in necessarily the extreme methodology that they're using. You do believe that it doesn't have to be all or nothing here. There could be a happy medium. I don't object to hydraulic fracturing. I'm not going to go out and say stop fracking everywhere now. What I'm saying is in New York State, we have an option of not opting into an extreme form an extreme form of fossil fuel development. All right, interesting perspective, certainly. Now, in addition to his, though, 
Take a listen um, to uh, this perspective. Kim got an interview with a very special guest who came all the way from Dimmick, Pennsylvania. Many people say ground zero in the fracking debate here. And uh, she says she came all the way to New York to warn New Yorkers that there are lessons to be learned from Pennsylvania. Isn't that right, Kim? Yeah, that's right, Rich. Joining me now is Rebecca Roeder. Rebecca, you've been a resident of Susquehanna County for 25 years. You say you're pro-clean air and pro-clean drinking water. That's what does that right. mean? Uh, well, in Susquehanna County, a lot of my uh, friends have bad water uh, related to drilling. As compressors are moving in to pressurize the gas from the pipelines and also finish the gas, they emit um, volatile organic compounds into the air and I've met people whose children have had nosebleeds from breathing in this air so I'm pro clean air. I want to keep my air healthy to breathe and my water clean and safe to drink. One of the things that we noticed when we spent so much time in Dimmick is that you guys have had to sort of create your own activist community because I'm guessing you feel like the industry isn't giving you the information you need or that the regulators aren't really doing their job it's almost as if every day is a crisis. When I first realized the potential for the impact on me and my neighbors in Susquehanna County about two and a half years ago, I went to Cabot um, and I was assured that there would be no environmental impact by um, Cabot. And my, my lease actually says that if they impact my water, they'll restore it to pre-drill conditions, which I now know they cannot do. Who wants to live in a gas field with the ever-present fear of having your water and your air and your health impacted, not to mention the truck traffic. So you feel pressured by these big companies? Yeah, because they basically say we'll do whatever we want to anyway. From our experience in Dimmick, you can't turn a corner without seeing a gas rig. And at night, you see them dotting the night sky because they're so bright. And it's not just Dimmick. It's spreading all across Susquehanna County and all the other counties in Pennsylvania. It's changed my daily, it's changed what's normal for me. Starting at 6 o'clock in the morning, I would hear the backup monitors of heavy equipment. I would hear uh, trees falling down, chainsaws, and that went on all, all day long because they're clear-cutting a lot of land for well pads, pipelines, and just lots to park all of their machinery on. It's loud, and the way the sound you know, travels, there's a constant hum. What do you want to tell New York about this? Uh, I would say to New York, think about what you're risking for a couple of dollars because you cannot buy health once your drinking water is shot they can't fix your aquifer once you're breathing in VOCs you can't change that in regulation no matter what we do now in Pennsylvania we can't turn time back we feel it's too late for us um, and people say that straight out it's too late for Pennsylvania but maybe we can save New York Rebecca thank you and Rich, before I throw it back to you, we want to remind people at home that we're doing this all week long. They can head to our website to see sneak peeks of what we got going on all week. And tomorrow, we're going to look at the environmental and health effects of this. And we're going to meet some of Rebecca's neighbors and sort of flesh out what's going on with the water down in Dimmick. Rich? Absolutely, Kim. Thank you. And we want to bring you at home into our conversation. And here's our question. Again, you can check this out at our website. Do the benefits of economic benefits of fracking outweigh the risks and just go to rnntv.com slash hydrofracking to sound off and you can also tweet kim directly at kim lengel on twitter and we're going to be bringing you another part of our special series each day this week culminating in that hour-long special coming this thursday February 16th, of course, at 6 o'clock. Well, tomorrow, as Kim mentioned, we are going to be getting some firsthand accounts of health problems people say that they're having as a result of hydrofracking. I'm going to leave you now with a sneak peek as we head into the commercial break. Stay with us. What I have to say to the gas industry, God forbid if one of their kids can't have kids like my wife can't. And she was in there taking a shower one night, and she came out, and she was extremely upset and she said my scalp is burning my scalp is on fire I don't know what the heck is going on but my scalp is burning and she was just like beside herself oh it's so hard to say what's the worst part of it because there's so many bad parts of it 